Hello, I'm Colin Green, and you are listening to Spike Bit, episode number 62. This is the second part of my chat with John Large from Red Dice Diaries. I'm calling it Journeys in the OSR, and I hope you enjoy. Hello there, John. How's it going? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad, Colin. Uh, just got back from work. A uh, bit of a bit of a hectic weekend, um, you know, doing things around the house, um, playing in Stars Without Number on Sunday, which was good fun. Uh, got a good game of that. Um, Johannes is running that. We sort of like alternate our campaign games. So he runs one Sunday. I get a bit of a break and just play. Then we like swap around the next Sunday. So that's all good. Oh, that's cool. Well, that's uh, Kevin Crawford. Stars Without Number, yeah? Yeah, Stars Without Number, Kevin Crawford. It's the revised edition we're doing. It's pretty much your normal sort of standard OSR sort of base as like the engine of the game. And then there's like a lot of stuff being added on top of it because obviously sci fi brings in like tech and all other sorts of like complications. It's a bit more rules than the sort of game I'd normally go for. I mean, I'd normally, if I was going for sci fi like OSR, I'd probably go for like White Star or something like that, which is a bit more okay. space opera y. But it's it's a good game. Like I say, it's, it's a bit more rawsy than I normally go for, but really enjoying it so far. We're sort of like a, a crew on this um, this ship we've got called the Little Rascal, <laughs> and we're um, we've basically got the we've sort of gone for a bit of a firefly takeoff. We've got um, Dennis who's playing like the captain, my friend Dave who's playing um, like a sort of hot shot pilot who thinks he's like yeah. the bee's knees, and then <laughs> then I'm playing the sort of like I suppose like. Like the engineer sort of type out of Firefly, you know, the like scrappy young kid who's like sort of grown up on a ship and like, always covered in grease and like fixing the engines and stuff. Sounds cool. I've actually just come out of a, a pretty mammoth gaming weekend. Not my normal weekend at all. I think I maybe hit around 15 hours of gaming. Kicked it off with playing a sort of my version of 5e, uh, my youngest and Arfed. That was Saturday morning. So you say your version, is that like sort of like house ruled or like a cut down version or it's just five E as much as I can remember of it kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> the feeling. It varies from week to week. It's like uh, how does this work again? What were we doing last time, you know? Yeah, we were. T- we, I was talking with them, um, a couple of the guys about them. Um, you know, the the adventures in Middle Earth, like the sort of Tolkien five E yeah. sort of version, and we were talking about that, and I was saying some of the things I like about it. And I'm I'm not a big fan personally of like running stuff like in Middle Earth because I think it's like it's really well defined. Loads of people know about it, and everyone's got like a different idea about what Middle yeah. Earth is. And you can sort of say, oh well, it's my version of Middle Earth until you blew it in the face. But like different people's ideas don't normally link up. But as we were talking about it, it got to the end of the conversation. I was like, oh, yeah, I really want to run some like adventures in Middle Earth now, even if I don't run it in Middle Earth, you know, just like using the classes and some of the like the extra systems they bring in. Yeah, there's some cool stuff in there. I've got, I'm just looking at my shelf, I've got uh, the, uh, the the player's handbook, whatever, I forget what that's called, and then the Law Master's Guide, and then I've got two of the sort of, they're like adventure path. Oh, you two up on me, man, I've just got the player's guide and the Law Master's Guide. They're nice, they're a little bit weighty, and they're you know, quite a lot of bump in them and everything. And and the trouble is with, with books like that, I always feel like um, I need to try and remember it all, which yeah. isn't which is a mistake. I don't think I do at all. But I really lo- I really want to try out some of them systems, and and I have heard good things like people talk about the j- journey mechanics and the audiences sound quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've got to admit, it's the journey mechanics that were like the, the big law for me. Because I mean, I've recently been reading. Some people, a few different blogs where people have talked about potentially for OSR games awarding XP for like exploration and discovering new areas and stuff like that, which yeah. I really like the sound of. And I've seen it in the sort of Tolkien books, there's like a big journey element to it, like eat like the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. They're both these sort of epic quests and journeys. So that's a cool idea. So it was the fact that that's sort of built into the game mechanically that really sort of drew me to that. It sounds like I've been on a similar voyage of discovery uh, or rediscovery uh, as yourself i know you've been looking at osr games and kind of gone back to my roots really and i feel like um, i should know all this stuff but because it is actually the osr now it is that revival or renaissance or whatever you want to call it there's all this wealth of new stuff mm-hmm. that feels like old stuff but 
actually it really is new stuff. So there's a wealth of things to di- to be discovered. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for myself, I, I sort of started off with like, um, like the old like Hogshead, like Warhammer Fantasy role play and yep. stuff like that. And then sort of as I went, the, as we were, we were talking about before we started recording, they were very sort of rawsy. And like yourself, I was like, oh, right, I've got to try and remember all this. You know, I've got to spend the hours like sweating over all the prep and it, it's all going to be like locked in my memory. Yep. And that led to me sort of like going towards like slightly more free form, I suppose, storytelling games from a better term like Fate and um, Fiasco and stuff like that, and like the PBTA games. and But then after like playing them for so long, and I still love those games, don't get me wrong, after playing them for so long, I, I sort of like reevaluated the OSR games and sort of looked at them and I was like, actually there's a lot of similarity between the two that I never originally thought of. Because they like say like the old sort of like BX, it's a very... It's not a system where it tries to like cover everything in the rules. There's quite a lot open to interpretation, which when I was younger, I didn't really understand. I was just like, right, it's got to be the rules, nothing but the rules, and I've got to remember it all. Whereas now I think sort of having sort of tried lots of different games, I'm now looking at it with different eyes, even though it's like ostensibly the same material. You've got the benefit of hindsight from years of seeing rules develop and get more, say maybe more and more complex further and further away from their roots when you look back you think wow actually right at the outset they weren't too far from what i wanted to do well that's it i mean i think that obviously there's there had to have been something in those early games otherwise i don't think they would have had the longevity they have had i mean with like um computer games and various like other media or like competing for your free time, your luxury time, really. Yeah. I think it's quite a telling thing that role-playing games are still going and they're going strong. And I mean, you have to look at like how many sort of professionally produced games there are out there with like companies with people like working full time for them. But at the other end of the spectrum, you've also got people who are just putting out stuff for like the love of the hobby. They're not expecting to like retire to a to a tropical island on it or like make mega books out of it they're just putting stuff out there because they they love the game that they, they want to share stuff to make a few quid on the side happy days but mm. it definitely uh guy gax and arneson and the other pioneers of the hobby they definitely hit on something and they, you know there's there's gold in them nar hills like and it's still being mined out to this day oh yeah i mean one of one of the things that always makes me laugh it and whenever like a a new OSR system, for want of a better term, comes out. <laughs> one of the first things you'll see, like, someone always comes up and says it on social media. Someone will be like, oh, we've already got 80 billion like other OSR systems. What do we need another one for? If I was being glib, the answer would be, well, you don't need it. If you don't like it, don't know, buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> N- yeah. No one's forcing you. But I-, I always think everyone puts like their own little spin on it. I mean, if you look at something like Lamentations of the Flame Princess, that's got the author's own sort of spin on it. It goes for like that weird sort of horror vibe. Uh, yeah. If you look at something like um, White Star or like White Box or something like that, they've got their own spin on it. Um, the the Hero's Journey by um, James Spahn as well. Oh, yeah. That that's him going like, oh, I love this idea of like the hero's sort of journey and progression, and I really want to make a game focused on that and exploration. So that's yeah. got a slightly different feel to it. And the main thing for me is like. All right, so so we've got 80 billion OSR systems. The fact is, I don't need to own all of them, but a lot of them, they're available for like free or pay yeah. what you want. So as a GM, one of the things I, I hate to do in a game, if I'm running a game, is if I sit down with some new players, I'm like, all right, okay, we're going to be running this game this week. And then I go, right, so you're going to need to get yourself a copy of like the player's handbook or whatever. Uh, oh, it's only going to cost you like $30. Yeah. And, and it's like, well, not everyone's got just thirty dollars just to like psh, and splash out on a on a book. Whereas if I'm running something like Basic Fantasy, is a great example where like pretty much all of it's available for free. I can just yeah. say to the players, like, right, here's a link. Go grab yourself a free copy of the book. Happy days. We can all get this. There's a low level of like initial buy-in in terms of money to get people involved. Yeah, um, and Basic Fantasy is a good example as well because you get the print copies at virtually cost from what I can gather. It's a good, definitely a good workhorse. And if you were like a teacher or a 
or a you know a youngster getting into the game, wow, that I mean back in the day I'd have loved to have had that. Because there's all the scenarios for it, and the monster stuff, equipment. There's loads for it. Well, that's it. I mean, if you think about it, let's say if you're like running an OSR game now, and you're like, oh, I want a monster for like X part of the adventure. You can go online, find about a dozen or so free OSR games, probably all with their own sort of monsters in, that yep. you can quite easily take, and with fairly minimal sort of tweaking, you can just put it into whatever OSR game is your choice i like that and i like the fact that because the osr rules are so simple i know that i can if i go like oh i want to i want to bring in like a house rule where you can you can hit, bind wounds to like heal d4 hit points or whatever at the end of a combat i know that by doing that i'm not going to be breaking some other part of the system that's linked to it whereas with the more complex systems unless you've got like a hundred percent understanding of that or like near as damn it which fair play to people are but I don't remember all that. No. So, and I'm always wary of going, like, oh, I want to tweak this, but then I'm like, oh, are there any other bits of the system that I've not thought about that are connected to it that are going to show up later and cause me problems? Yeah, because if you've, if you've got a game that's got them sort of skill trees and stuff like that and you, you uh, just knock it all out of whack and then it ends up with, with it all coming, crashing down around your ears. When I'm picking a game... I want a game that's going to have as few obstacles as possible to for me and the players to get into that game and start enjoying it as quickly as possible. Whether it's cost of like getting the players the rules, whether it's easy to understand rules, whatever it is, I want there to be as few sort of bumps along the way. Like I, I don't, don't want to have to sit down and say, like, all right, we're going to play this game. Right, it's going to take you like four hours to generate a character or whatever. I want the players to sit down. We'll have a bit of a chat, maybe like half an hour, if that. They'll get some characters down, and then we can just be like, boom, straight into the game, and we can get on with enjoying ourselves. And there you go, folks. If you enjoyed that, there's more to come. I've got future episodes planned. All that remains for me to do now is to say thanks for listening, look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later.